Grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Send out your light and your truth that they may lead me, and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory Glory to to the the Father, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit. as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Come, let us adore him. I invite you to join me in saying the portion of Psalm 80 appointed for today. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow, and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea, and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall, so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven. Behold and tend this vine. 
preserve what your right hand has planted. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones. He planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned nor hoed. It shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And they said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give them the the produce at the harvest time. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. The chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables. They realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text from Isaiah this morning pivots on an exclamation of touching bewilderment. It begins as a love song describing every act of tender care taken by my beloved in his planting of a vineyard, and everything was so well prepared and so carefully tended. These few verses are beautifully lyrical. The digging and the clearing wasn't work. Every task was rather a disclosure of desire, of the longing to see something lovely come to fruition. And yet, for all that was done, The vineyard yielded useless fruit. And so subtly then, without declaration of the change, the song shifts from the objective distance of the third person to the intimacy of the first person. And we are invited into the profound disappointment between me and my vineyard by means of an aching question. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done? It's a rending cry. We know it well. We ask the same. How did we get here? It was supposed to be otherwise. I had thought that things would be different. I had thought that we were headed in a better direction. And I don't know, I have no idea where or how or why things turned. And now nothing seems as I had expected. What more was there for me to do? This question is so spacious so existential, it reveals the fault line that runs so deep through our human experience. 
And in the text, no answer is given and no response comes. The disappointment is inexplicable. It's a wound that can't be softened by reasoned excuses. And thus it hangs before us as a futility that comes as if from nowhere, without warning, invisible, that's contagious before we even begin to be symptomatic. What more was there to do that I have not done? And for a moment, that question lingers as if time itself has been suspended. And then the consequence is stated, delivered in the form of a swift and devastating judgment. All that was hoped for will be ripped away, and everything that was done will be undone, not quietly, but with a vengeance. In the name of justice, the vineyard will be violently torn up and made a wasteland. This is what is deserved, and because it's deserved, it's what's demanded. No explanation is needed. We already know that the destruction is fitting, and even more so, it's darkly satisfying. For it's the imposition of an awful and tragic righteousness. But by God, it's so right, so, so be it. In Isaiah's context, this meant that Israel would be, would be dragged into captivity and the kingdom would be dissolved and generations would suffer in exile and for a time, God would depart from them. And what began as a love song devolved into a bitter rant of resentment and fury. The same drama is played out in Jesus' parable of the vineyard. Once again, everything was prepared in good order. Every step was taken for the vineyard to be productive in all of its operations. But then, inexplicably, the tenants refused to act according to the usual agreement, and they began an ugly process of escalating revolt, which, as if inexorably, led finally to deadly violence, pointedly and intimately directed at the owner himself. Only this time, no bewilderment is expressed, and no room for pause is given, nor is any love spoken or lost. After telling the story, Jesus wastes no time with disappointment. Rather, he immediately asks his audience, the chief priests of the temple, what the owner of the vineyard should do. And they, in the frenzy of the violence described, demand the justice of a very similar tragic righteousness. The tenants, they insist, should be made to suffer miserably and be put to death. It's what they deserve without question. It's a sentence of judgment that the chief priests deliver without the slightest hesitation. Because it's so evidently right. And they, after all, are the keepers of the law. And they are the ones charged with the duty of exacting from the people whatever is necessary to maintain what is just. And who could disagree with their reasoning? It's only then, however, that Jesus offers an alternative response. It's a bit like Isaiah's love song. But this time it comes not at the beginning, but at the end of the story. In full realization of all that has happened. And it, too, is inexplicable. It doesn't arise from reasoned assessment of what ought to be. Instead, Jesus counters the chief priests with a question that's directed 
toward fruition. Even in the face of all that's bent toward anger and a penalizing justice. Have you never read the scriptures, he asks. Have you never read the scriptures? For they announce the overturning of exactly the things that we take to be most necessary and sure. The very stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. And all we can do then is marvel that the tragic righteousness deserved will be displaced by a salvation freely given, unmerited, that lifts us out of the spiral of judgment that lays us waste. Have you never read the scriptures? It's a question meant to give us pause. And from that pause, to be able to see a very different light breaking upon us. In 1932, fully a year before Adolf Hitler's ascendancy, the streets in Germany were filled with political fighting. Divisions were deep. The hatred between factions was visceral. The stakes were very high. Their democracy was at risk. And amid all this turmoil, when so many believed that it was the church's responsibility to forcefully join in the fray, Karl Barth held out another possibility. In a sermon preached in Bonn, he said, it is surely true. Without joy in the lordship of God, the old dogmatism of everyone against everything undoubtedly remains. With that deadly seriousness with which the so-called good people embitter one another's lives, a good deal more than the so-called evil people, which serves to make the world a hell in the name of ideals, sometimes even Christian ideals, consciously or unconsciously controlled by a reciprocal war of extermination. He didn't mince his words. Bart may have well wondered himself, how did we get here? It was supposed to be otherwise. And we are today, in many respects, in a very similar place, despairingly or gleefully engaged in various wars of extermination, invoking an ever-escalating language of tragic righteousness. Bart doggedly refused to follow suit. He sang a different song that marveled at the love of God that triumphs over every evil, even the evil that is frighteningly close at hand, that drives the chaos and the violence we fear most. Bart knew that faith is more spacious than bewilderment, and thus it makes room for joy. And that joy isn't ephemeral, it's transcendent and it's transforming, just as it can be humble and sober and determined. It's not simply reflective of a pleasurable result, Christian joy is disarming and resilient, and it discloses the truth of the world. That which endures after everything else falls away, and tragedy is overcome. 
by reconciliation. This is our song. This is our prayer. It should be the form of our character. Please join me in reaffirming our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day, we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And we, we shall never hope in vain. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Grant, we beseech the Almighty God that the words which we have heard this day with our outward ears may through thy grace be so grafted inwardly in our hearts that they may bring forth in us the fruit of good living to the honor and praise of thy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who created all persons in your image, we thank you for the wonderful diversity of races and cultures in this world. Enrich our lives by ever widening circles of fellowship and show us your presence in those who differ most from us until our knowledge of your love is made perfect in our love for all your children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. We remember especially Sean Garner, George, Beverly, Bob, Leela, Pam, Linnea, Joan, John, 
Yvonne, Peter, Riley, Julie, Taggart, Stephanie, and Rebecca. We commend to your mercy all those who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. We remember especially Mr. and Mrs. Joseph W. Lippincott, Jr. And now may we pray together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen.
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen.